do the impossible, see the invisible. Row, row, fight the power, touch the untouchable, break the unbreakable. Row, row, fight the power. Considering all of the recent action in America and Europe from the militant anarcho communist group Antifa, as well as the rising prominence of anarcho-capitalist positions amongst libertarians and particularly millennials on the right, I feel like it might be useful to do a quick explainer on modern anarchy and the various factions amongst anarchism. Anarchy attracts radicals like flies to honey, so I'll spend a bit of time discussing some of the less relevant schools of thought as well, and the more robust ones obviously because some of these are honestly hilarious. Unless you've been significantly involved in political conflict with modern anarchists, then you will probably be seriously surprised by what and how these various groups of people think. Most people would assume that all versions of this philosophy would be best represented today by places like northern Mexico, where the government is simply unable to enforce the law. There's Somalia, where there basically is no government, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the government is purportedly corrupt enough to actively fail at enforcing the law. Each of them has no government, right? Naturally, anarchists object to this classification, and they feel like they're being misrepresented because those places are shitholes. Now, personally, I actually agree that they are being misrepresented. In my opinion, the only way to describe these countries and still accurately represent anarchism is to point out that these places are DANGEROUS shitholes. If you're typing, be sure to put the DANGEROUS in all caps for emphasis. The inherent dangers associated with a lawless society are numerous and complex. History has proven this to us repeatedly, and it has not changed since antiquity. Even related species of monkeys nearly all impose hierarchies within their tribes, and that is how socialization is moderated. I'm sure to catch some flack for saying this, even amongst my friends, yet anything that you think makes one society without a functional government any different from another society without a functional government would itself constitute a government, I promise you. There are either rules or there are not rules. If no one is there to enforce them, then there are no rules. Capiche? It does not matter how you think society ought to organize itself. Assuming there is no government, then people will do whatever the hell they want to. Usually this is to benefit themselves, Sometimes it's at the expense of others, and before the anarcho-capitalists even start in about private police forces that will stop gang activity, such an organization would perfectly embody a protection racket. Add some of that competition, which will apparently solve everything, and now we have a civil war between two groups of mercenaries competing for dominance. Sounds lovely. Of course, they would immediately respond that our government currently embodies all of this anyway. And yes, it does, actually. But it has a deliberate monopoly on violence, which is not only frequently influenced by our votes, providing incentive for good behavior from the representatives, but it's also deliberately filtered through enough bureaucracy and checks and balances to make a meeting held in accordance with parliamentary procedure feel like it's a freaking game of laser tag. To this they'll say that government can and does occasionally abuse this power anyway, which is admittedly a good point. I will personally support anyone in opposing such actions. Do not mistake my allegiances in this particular regard. However, suggesting that we should respond by giving this power to everyone is laughable. I'll address these guys further when we get to anarcho-capitalism. If I've reached any ANCATs out there that are here and you don't make it that far, just know that even Ayn Rand was not down with anarchism at all because she liked capitalism, which I've sourced in the description with the Ayn Rand Institute. If you don't know who she is, then I'm happy to introduce you to the spiritual godmother of your worldview. Anyway, the rest of you just raised the length of that discussion to about the fifth power, and you now have an idea of what trying to have a discussion with an anarchist zealot is like. Regarding anarcho-capitalists in particular, that's usually spent about two-thirds arguing whether it is possible to privatize roads without de facto monopolies. And the final third would amount to property rights theory, the semantics surrounding their claim that taxation is theft, and a whole lot of other stuff that really is never going to go anywhere. Of course, there are many good and reasonable folks as well as the zealots within the movement, and if you do fall into this category, I would like you to know that I mean only to criticize your politics, not you. I operate under the assumption that people have agency, alongside a remarkable capacity to learn. Additionally, I would be more than happy to carry on a civil discussion with you down in the comments. Just know that I am at the point of brutal honesty when discussing this particular philosophy, as recently as advocates have gotten very very good at knocking back softball. So congratulations for that, but now it's time for fastballs because there's no other choice with you guys. The same goes for any anarcho-communists out there, of course. However, 
work. Please remember my house rules, as you and your compatriots seem to really enjoy breaking them. Those would be as follows. Violence is bad. Speech cannot possibly be violence. Yet, speech that calls directly for violence is still bad. Also, historical revisionism is not tolerated as long as I catch it, and it really pisses me off, so stay away from that as well. I can't imagine that many of you will take me up on this, of course, because with those contingencies, what argument do you have left? Oh, go tell me if you've got a good one. Whilst exploring anarchism, you'll likely be surprised to find that there's a political spectrum about as broad as the standard version, and each of them has different visions of what a stateless society might look like, and or how it is best achieved. By far, the most prominent anarchist factions, and the only ones that are truly relevant to us today, are the individualist anarcho-capitalists. They're mostly found in America, and they consider themselves to be on the far right wing of the political spectrum. And the anarcho-communists, who consider themselves to be on the far left. These groups are diametrically opposed to each other, despite both wanting an anarchistic state, because not only do they wish to arrive there in completely different ways, but they both have entirely different visions of how an anarchistic state function. These visions are often so different that advocates of either position might as well be worshipping Satan in the eyes of people who espouse the other position. And yes, I am aware that the term anarchistic state is inherently paradoxical for any of you grammar Nazis out there, but it's easier than referring to a territory without national sovereignty that also refuses to defer sovereignty to other powers by its description. To understand where these people are getting their ideas, we need to understand the political compass, so go ahead and allow me to explain it briefly. According to the standard political compass, linked in the description in case you want to find out where you stand, the x-axis represents the government economic intervention. It goes from total socialism, including things like guaranteed equal wages, on the far left, to a totally unobstructed free market on the right. Socialized healthcare benefits, welfare, and public education, alongside policies such as the minimum wage and environmental regulations, each represent socialist elements within modern Western cultures. The y-axis represents individual rights and freedoms, ranging from an authoritarian police state up at the top, within which the government can do whatever it deems is necessary, to what is often considered anarchy on the bottom, wherein individuals have maximum freedoms. Therefore, people who advocate on behalf of anarchy often consider themselves to be on the bottom border of the compass, and they've even divided themselves amongst individualist anarchy with respect to individual freedoms and collectivist anarchy. There is a massive problem with that summation, however, because the very fiber of the social contract is the sovereign government of a nation. Any actions that a government takes should hypothetically be taken on behalf of its citizens. They are public servants, after all. And regardless of whether or not they are, we still need a government if we want to have any rights against each other. For instance, with every new freedom granted to the citizenry, the government is by default obliged to enforce that freedom. The classic and most necessary examples of this are that your government is tasked with preventing you from being murdered and your property from being stolen. Should they fail, they are then still obliged to seek justice according to the social contract by which everyone in this country is simultaneously bound. In a democracy, we just call it the law. Of course, would-be murder victims also have a right to self-defense, but the police provide a level of protection that is intended to keep the citizens out of danger and to assure that justice is served as often as possible. This demonstrates nicely why we must give the government certain powers in order to stop people from infringing on the rights of other people. Those distinctions miss anarchists by a mile, with the exception of anarchists who argue on behalf of natural law. These argue that human rights are self-evident and will thus be respected regardless of institutional power. There are numerous ways to make such an argument, including from divine rights theory, Locke's slightly more critical natural rights theory, Hume's far more critical ideas on human nature and morality, along with the rest of the laundry list of philosophers between the Enlightenment and the 1900s who recognized theories regarding morality, society, and religion, which is far more tied up in this mind-melting war zone of philosophy than many people today realize that it is. I disagree with all of these, of course, but this subject warrants a video of its own, and I will deliver one probably relatively soon because it's a subject that I have been researching quite extensively for what is probably a matter of years now. If you want a sampler of that discussion, I encourage you to read a book by the Anglo-Irish statesman Edmund Burke titled A Vindication of Natural Society. 
In the description, I've linked a free library where you can download it as an ebook, HTML PDF, simplified HTML, and even in audio via MP4. You've probably heard of Burke through his most famous quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. That type of moralistic preachiness was one of his major staples. However, not in this book. The reason that this book is so damn interesting is not its content alone, but also its context. It argues brilliantly that if we assume that there's no god in this universe, nearly every successful case we have against anarchy becomes moot. Ironically, Burke was an unwavering Christian and conservative, so the book was clearly intended to be satirical. That said, the arguments therein are so good that even today there's a great deal of debate surrounding his true intentions, as well as his reasons for the arguments therein and their potential validity. Okay, let's get back to the politics. We might as well get the basics out of the way. Anarchy means a lack of government. Merriam-Webster defines it as follows. Definition 1a, an absence of government. b, a state of lawlessness or political disorder due to the absence of governmental authority, or for instance, the city's descent into anarchy. Or c, a utopian society of individuals who enjoy complete freedom without government. Definition 2 refers to a state of chaos, which is not relevant to the political discussion at all, and definition 3 simply just links to anarchism. Naturally, it is those who prescribe the definition 1 subcategory C that have motivated this video. Over the course of the video, we will talk briefly about their various positions in this regard. Spoiler alert, visions of utopia never do play well with others. Anarchism, in turn, has two definitions. One, a political theory holding all forms of governmental authority to be unnecessary and undesirable, as well as advocating a society based on voluntary cooperation and free association of individuals and groups. Two, the advocacy or practice of anarchistic principles. Let's keep playing their game and head over to anarchistic, which is hyperlinked in the definition of anarchism. This redirects you to anarchist, which they then define as one, a person who rebels against any authority, established order, or ruling power. Power. Two, a person who believes in, advocates, or promotes anarchism or anarchy. As especially one who uses violent means to overthrow the established order. It's always annoying when words circle back upon each other like that because it provides a loophole argument for people who want to incorporate nonsense into their no true Scotsman fallacies, along with broadening definitions and a whole bunch of other different logical fallacies and general just argument diluters. But thankfully, they certainly did give us enough to work with to get started on the front of disseminating these guys and their ideas. You should also be sure to note that first definition of anarchism because it's going to become quite relevant later on. Even though a voluntary system could never fill the fundamental role of government as mediators without excluding detractors and thus ironically establishing its own sovereignty, that is to say it would literally become a government, most anarchists believe wholeheartedly that it can. Once we understand this logistical leap that they're making, it becomes far easier to see how they can be broken up into such drastically different factions based on the economic systems that they advocate for. And believe you me, we will be looking at some of these in detail in a minute. For now though, the layman's takeaway from this ought to be that anarchism rejects the premise of government and believes that any association should be voluntary. There is a clear caveat within those definitions though that is worth addressing, and I've encountered it from time to time whilst reading historical accounts, political opinions, as well as alignments. That is to say that there are many individuals who are regarded as either anarchists or anarchistic sympathizers for either rebelling against a system with an indeterminate objective or for simply objecting to government in principle for various reasons, even for rejecting a government in principle for various reasons. A perfect example of this is the grandfather of the prominent anarcho-pacifist movement, Henry David Thoreau, as well as his spiritual successors including Mahatma Gandhi, who was heavily influenced by Thoreau, so notably his essay on civil disobedience that he publicly thanked America for providing him with a teacher in Thoreau. Luckily, the entire library of his works are available for free, courtesy of the Thoreau Society, which I have linked in the description in case you want to read this essay or any of his other works for yourself. However, it seems evident to me that Thoreau was a minarchist, or an advocate for minable government. This is still consistent with his famous anarchist quotes, such as, that which governs best governs least. Gandhi later walked the same road, well summarized, for instance, in his quote, the state evil is not the cause, but the 
effect of social evil, just as the sea waves are the effect, not the cause of the storm. The only way of curing the disease is by removing the cause itself. I have chosen to use this because it's widely considered to be an endorsement of anarchism, which I find to be a laughably poor attempt to find confirmation bias within the works of a great man. It seems clear here that he is suggesting the state is inherently our response to human imperfections. And the only way to improve the state is by its constituents, its improving themselves. This is a brilliant way to articulate the situation, though the bit that is not said is that the problem is fundamentally unsolvable. Human beings are not and will never be perfect. That is not to say that we can't make progress, mind you, which has happened repeatedly throughout history, in various directions of course, and with various degrees of success. However, assuming that you set the bar at nonviolence, we will only ever be able to approach this goal indefinitely, of course so long as we remain imperfect beings. Somewhere along the way, however, the notion that pacifists must be inherently anarchistic because the state is inherently violent became lodged so deeply within the public consciousness that most of us have just decided to sit around waiting for the second coming of Arthur Pendragon so he can finally pull the damn thing out again. Asking if violence is ever necessary is not even the right question, and many of history's most prominent pacifists seem to have recognized this even in their eras as well. If you do not meet violence with either violence or another apt form of repercussions, then violence will simply be visited repeatedly on you by others who want something from you and can overlook any standing moral obligations they might have against those means. Therefore, if we truly wish to be pacifists, then the question we ought to be asking ourselves is how do we minimize the necessity of violence? What alternatives and arguments can we offer others to help phase it out successfully? And where do we draw the line? If you take issue with this sentiment, I'll return to it at the end of the video, which will conclude with the story of the Buddhists in Burma. I'm going to talk about their recent history, which is likely the straw that broke the camel's back, the back of the most strictly pacifist people the world over. Of course, assuming that one acknowledges government as a necessary evil, and simply seeks to reduce it as necessary, then they would generally be considered to hold a conventionally virtuous stance. However, that would still make you what the anarchists refer to as a statist. The term statist refers to their outgroup, which in turn encompasses everyone who is not an anarchist. It is worth noting that this process of othering a large portion of society is widely considered to be a red flag signifying cult-like behavior, but it isn't intrinsically a reason to disregard an argument either. Additionally, if we were to consider everyone who either had a problem with some part of the government or thought violence was still evil regardless of its necessity to truly be anarchistic, then virtually everyone would wind up being anarchistic and the word would be effectively nullified. Therefore, I think we should accept that such assertions are actually not true Scotsmen for once, and are rather poetic in nature or just plainly wrong, and thus only those who reject government prescribe to anarchism in the form that we're going to be discussing today. Now I've had numerous debates with advocates of both positions in real life and online, and I can honestly say that each bring up legitimate concerns. Though once trapped inside an echo chamber for any amount of time, they tend to tremendously overcompensate, to the point at which they have decided that government is utterly worthless, and members of literally any other ideology are these statists who think about as often as sheep on lithium. Oh, the irony. But let's first vaccinate ourselves, this line of thinking. Though rather than giving ourselves a tiny bit of the disease, I find that in politics it works best to just take on the most outrageous forms first. This makes the ones who at least have the issue to talk about seem like a breath of fresh air by comparison, and by extension this makes them significantly more tolerable than they otherwise would have been. Without further ado, I give you a sampling of the other recognized anarchist movements. That is to say, recognized by at least their scholars, activists, a few websites, and now me. Plus, Wikipedia does acknowledge most of them, and it can source you directly to some of their echo chambers as well, which are fantastic places to take a vacation and just laugh your ass off, in case you ever get tired of politics only making just enough sense to be infuriating, but not enough to actually represent reality. Within the subcategory of green anarchism, which focuses primarily upon the environment and the lasting impact of humanity upon it, I have found two groups worthy of note. 
The first of these are the anarcho-primitivists, who advocate essentially what it says on the tin. They've read enough Rousseau to understand the impacts of civilization, but they reject the notion that we can no longer regress to savagery within nature. Imagine Walden without the cabin, or without the supplies, and certainly without the return to organized society, and you've got the gist. I do actually see, of course, where these guys are coming from. However, it shocks me that most of them still have internet access after putting their money where their mouths are, which they obviously did, and disappearing into the wilderness. By the way, if any anarcho-primitivist activists are still watching this video, I hope you know how many lambs had to be killed to get that bucket of lamb's blood you're about to toss on that rich person because you don't like their coat. Another leopard is going to have to die as well now in order to make them a new one. Slow clap for you. Anarcho-naturism appears to be the fusion of nudist philosophy with political philosophy. According to naturismo.org, linked in the description, but due to gratuitous nakedness I'll warn you it's not likely safe for work, a young worker under the pseudonym Silvestre de Campo writes, I find great pleasure in being naked in the woods, bathed in light and air, two natural elements we cannot do without. By shunning the humble garment of the exploited person, Garments which, in my opinion, are the result of all the laws devised to make our lives better. We feel that there are no others left but just the natural laws. Clothes mean slavery for some and tyranny for others. Only the naked man who rebels against all societal norms stands for anarchism, devoid of the prejudices of outfit imposed by our money-oriented society. I honestly don't think I need to say anything else, I'm just gonna leave it at that quote, let that one sink in. Anarcha-feminism is a thing, because of course it is. These people are apparently hypercritical of marriages, harmful to women, because presumably they have never heard of alimony. Obviously, human civilization itself is patriarchy, and it just makes sense that we must abandon it completely if we ever want women to be truly free of systems of oppression. I'm not sure what their stance on rape laws are. I'm assuming they've never heard of them, considering they still think we live in a rape culture here in the West. But if you ask one, I would not be surprised if her head summarily exploded. In all seriousness, though, considering the pathological nature by which some feminists attempt to make things a feminist issue, it is hardly surprising that political opinions would not follow suit. If anyone objects to that claim, please see the peer-reviewed papers on feminist glaciology, as well as the general actions of Sweden's feminist foreign policy. Honestly, I do not despise Margaret Wallstrom, the Swedish minister who implemented the policy, though. After a recent visit to Saudi Arabia, we watched a harsh change in her attitude and policy towards the country, due to it miserably failing nearly all Western feminist tests for women's rights. And this does show both a principled commitment and a serious set of balls that I find lacking in many feminist politicians and academics. Shocker, right? But for the record, I still do disagree with much of her policy, and if you're wondering why, just look up how well Sweden's feminist snowplowing initiative went down last year. That's all I'm going to say about feminist policy for the time being. Next up to bat, we have the anarcho-queers. No, I am not joking. The anarcho-queer movement suggests that anarchy might resolve the issues faced by LGBT and trans people in today's society, because a bunch of people read Foucault, I guess, and got really, really confused. I suppose it would certainly stop institutional discrimination, though, by way, of course, of deconstructing the institutions entirely, but how do you intend to get sex change operations without hospitals? What recourse would you then have to leverage against Christian hospitals, or even Christian bakeries for that matter? Also, good luck convincing your ensuing gangland overlord that trans people are totally normal. I'll be busy in literally any other country laughing my ass off long, long before that happens. Next up, we have post-left anarchism. And now, while I'm not a leftist myself, that does not mean I would like to abolish the state in order to stop the leftists from co-opting it. Honestly, I think I'd rather have some form of compromised socialism light than anarchism. From what I can tell of this group, it's mostly just people who don't particularly enjoy politics. Based on the Relatively article, Your politics are boring as fuck, linked in the description by Miss Nadia C. I reason that these guys seem to be basically a group that want nothing to do with politics and yet had it shoved down their throats by enough leftists that the anarchistic aspect of the identity is simply just a large middle finger to the establishment. Beyond, quote, wrecked feminist, unquote, style memes, I don't see much of a legitimate case for anything. 
so there isn't much for me to dissect here. This brings us to regular post-anarchism, which really sounds like it should describe me, considering I consider myself to be part of a generation of thinkers that has moved beyond the acceptable concept of anarchism. However, I would be wrong. This anarchy appears to have a post-structuralist outlook, and we can see that demonstrated here in a lecture by Michael Andre, wherein he sweeps away a certain number of dogmas. This is one of his great affairs of anarchist thought. He sweeps away the rejection of the state, refusal of elections, the idea that capitalism would only be a moment in the unfolding of the world, and he says on the contrary, for the philosopher, this state is useful. Wow. Only postmodernists could manage anarchy with government. I mean, god damn, this is a new level of stupid. And here I was, thinking that they had actually achieved their mission of identifying the upper limits of human stupidity via action before the millennium had ended. I am often critical of post-structuralism, if you couldn't tell, considering that while it does occasionally identify weak spots and interesting questions in modern understanding, I'll be glad to admit that, it also does seem to urge its practitioners to respond to such situations, and even to non-issues as well, by burning the entire goddamn house down. I do not care if the place is condemned, you do not burn your own house down until you have built or otherwise attained a new one preferably one that you've tested and proven to be categorically better than the old one. Though I digress. Let's get back to the people who also do make sense, but are not quite as good at woo. Never mind, it appears I spoke too soon, because next we have left-wing market anarchism, colloquially known as libertarian socialism. I can only assume these are covertly another anti-political organization that is deliberately hiding their motives, though sadly this does not appear to be the case. I say that because they've effectively just called themselves everything. In America today, the right and left wings of the political spectrum indicate the level of government intervention that you would advocate for within the free market. Therefore, many on the left have acquired a distaste for terms like free market, which are traditionally associated with the right, as opposed to socialism, which defines you in your other name. And this, in its purest form, is tantamount to very extreme wealth distribution. Yes, libertarian is technically referring to the social regulations, and therefore this name does technically fall into the bottom two quadrants of the graph that opposes authoritarianism, and it would be possible to construct such a platform if you're hypocritical about where and how you like your government intervention. Only some of that offense was intended towards libertarian socialists who are not anarchists, because while I can't for the life of me understand your motivations, your position could still technically exist at least and therefore you might potentially have rational arguments. Therefore, I'll reserve judgment until it is warranted. None of that actually matters for these particular guys, though, because if you are anarchistic, then you are off the goddamn scale. This non-existent government could not possibly do anything in or with the market, nor could it actually enforce capitalism either, for that matter. Since only Schrodinger's cat could possibly occupy both ends of one linear spectrum while simultaneously not even existing on the spectrum, I'm going to assume that these guys are just very impressive trolls. Assuming that the one time in my life I decide to be optimistic, things will actually work out in kind, then very well played, guys. Anarcho-transhumanism deserves a mention next, which is a fusion of anarcho-syndicalism and transhumanism. The former is a common platform within anarcho-communism, and we will get there later. The second half of narco-transhumanism is defined as the belief or theory that the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations, particularly via science and technology. Now, in practice, this is not nearly as insane as it sounds. However, we can be sure of two things about people who prescribe so dogmatically to these ideologies that they felt the need to lump them together and make a whole new word. They overthink the hell out of everything, and they have consciously labeled their two favorite labels, presumably so that they can become the anarcho-communist cool kids, while simultaneously perpetuating the dense cloud of confusion obscuring them from everyone who would otherwise call out their bullshit in a New York minute. Now I'd just like to take a second to acknowledge anarcho-monarchism as well. Yep, that exists somewhere, and not just on a deep, dark, and very stupid corner of the internet either. It was apparently endorsed by Salvador Dali, as well as J.R.R. Tolkien himself, for whatever that's worth to you. Both of those guys have phenomenal imaginations, so I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that it was either metaphorical or just a fantastic troll. Actually, in that light, I think I might set my own official political label as narco-monarchist from here on out. At some point, this might help us start a movement online, and 
maybe we could rally up the troops to finally seize the means of production on behalf of Great Lord Keck. And if you got that joke, Chatelet, brother. Let's knock out a narco-capitalist. These guys have an extremely Randite worldview. They're predominantly found in America, often proudly representing themselves as libertarians, though minarchists do share that label as well. ANCAPs believe that laissez-faire capitalism can solve all the world's problems. And they do have a case on the ground that we do not have a free market at present. Their argument regarding monopolies is that they are only sustained through crony capitalism. For instance, the term monopoly originally referred exclusively to the status granted by the government. I don't prescribe to this in 100% of cases. For instance, the power that Google currently has to change the world with the click of a button. One tiny little change to their search results can lead millions of people in a direction that they otherwise would not have even thought. However, I do generally agree with ANCAPs on economics. Socially, they prescribe to the non-aggression principle, which simply states that one should never commit aggression upon another person. And in this light, they make a similar case for the anarcho-pacifists. They also occasionally argue for privatized courts that would enforce natural laws. Non-aggression principle is their one and only holy commandment. And if someone violates it, then the people around them have a moral obligation to protect themselves. While this is generally actually a fantastic principle, it does fall short in some significant areas. Pollution is an obvious one that's brought up often. Considering that every time you get in your car, your neighbors ought to have your head in their crosshairs before you get out of the driveway. Not only do these run into problems in the areas of property rights, safety, and infrastructure though, they also fall victim to the standard anarchist fallacy of the modern age that defense against foreign nations or gangs can be facilitated without a government. Unfortunately, any coalition of citizens designed to do these things would essentially become a government under its own rules, and by extension any private institutions would be bad news. Go open up The Prince by Machiavelli somewhere online and see what he has to say about private armies if you do not believe me. Lastly we come to the biggest reasons that I take issue with anarcho-capitalists, and that would be their insistence that capitalism itself could be facilitated without a government. Who backs the currency, guys? Think about it, gold coins would hardly be common enough to go around. And shortages as well as crises would have nobody to intervene, leaving would-be citizens condemned to become little better than survivalists, stockpiling goods just in case. The corporations would probably hoard supplies, of course, but contrary to popular belief, this would be bad. And I'm way on the right, since they could easily flood the market on certain essential goods, starve out the competition, then hike prices to a point that would likely literally kill people. Also. What would be left to protect us between allegiances amongst the leading corporations, such as the one we see between modern cable companies? I doubt it would be competition, considering a lack of public education would not only make it very expensive to learn, especially extremely advanced skills, but it could be easily corrupted and influenced to leave some things out, especially if the parents do not have a comparable education that would enable them to know better. All in all, I do agree with anarcho-capitalists on quite a bit but that would likely be due to the left-leaning policies and politicians which bound today. Ultimately, I would come to a point of contentedness significantly before they would. And on top of that, I do honestly find their capitalist anarchism idea to just be self-refuting. Now, let's avail ourselves and get the anarcho-communists over with. This is the ideology to which Antifa prescribes, and it seems to me that it's been the dominant form of anarchy for the last one or two hundred years. If you haven't read Marx, you might not realize that he initially envisioned communism as the state society would eventually transcend into as a result of advancement, automation, and ever-rising efficiency. State socialism was merely envisioned as a way in which we could get there before that time. Anarcho-communists have even recognized that this will not work. Pretty obvious, because it didn't work. Don't try telling that to the socialists. Yet they still want the paycheck without doing the job, in more ways than one. To their credit, narco-syndicalism does attempt to answer the how. They assert that a country's workers can use unions to exert control on greater society. Yet, they still also believe that the state is evil, and thus they reject socialism as established in Russia, which they call Leninism. How they expect human beings to act as a hive mind during the revolution is, of course, the least of their problems. Because communism in practice 
couldn't even get its books balanced while settling everything with such an iron fist that it would be more accurate to say Stalin governed by hip-firing two Uzis. These guys are the brunt of the reason for anarchy's violent reputation, despite the pacifist forms discussed earlier. They have a clear vision of utopia that they think they can reach here on Earth. And with that mindset, everyone is reduced to either a tool to help them achieve that goal, or an obstacle that's standing in their way. To quote Stalin himself, Ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns, so why would we let them have ideas? Unfortunately, the anarcho-communists seem to have internalized this message. Considering that they think every worker will always contribute his share, these are the potential benefits that it would be unnecessary to maintain borders or expel anyone ever. Just think about how many people died in the gulags, then Google how many more people starved in Mao's China because he didn't have them. I'll probably do a standalone video on communism at some point, because the Gulag Archipelago and Animal Farm, amongst others, are favorites of mine, and because incredibly large numbers of people today seem to be missing the boat entirely on this issue. For now, though, I'll leave the anarcho-communist discussion with my favorite Marx quote of all time. During the French Revolution, which was inherently Marxist, and was influenced heavily if not directly inspired by him, he would constantly receive visitors from France and England where he lived, and they were eager to meet him in person and thank him. Unfortunately, after coming to grips with their views and their methods, his response in French can be translated thusly, all I know is that I'm not a Marxist. To conclude my discussion on anarchy, I personally find the concept to be even more inherently dangerous than fascism, including socialist and free market dictatorships alike. My argument for this is that those societies, at least rich and influential enough people, are protected by the government and will not likely be killed before growing old. Now, I'm neither of those things, but I could at least hope to make my way up the ladder in those societies. That said, uh, let's end by discussing the Buddhists in Burma, the ones I mentioned towards the beginning of the video. Most of us are aware of what they're doing now, but the reason that the most pacifist peoples of all time are currently committing mass killings is far less talked about and can really help us understand the dangers of violence, particularly in response to non-violence. The 8898 protests were a pro-democracy protest in Burma, in opposition to the standing militaristic government. This happened just before the country legally changed its name to Myanmar, a change which itself is widely considered to be wrapped up in this internal struggle. I've linked the Human Rights Watch page in the description, which backs the long-forgotten reality that thousands of Buddhists were simply massacred in retaliation to the protest. This infighting dominated internal headlines again in 2007, when a Buddhist monk-led protest resulted in hundreds of deaths and thousands of prisoners divided into camps denoted as passers-by, those who watched, those who clapped, and those who joined in the protests. Most outlets reported only around 10 deaths during the initial clampdown, but I've linked a Telegraph article which came out once the first few prisoners were released. After interviewing people who were connected to those involved, a turncoat military officer, and a few other sources, the narrative spun by the Burmese government at the time began to crack and fall away. We will likely never know how many people were ultimately killed or imprisoned, but that is the result of pacifism in the face of totalitarianism. By the end of 2007, it was said that the decades-old revolution was ended, and that its spirit was dead. However, now the rest of the world knew, and thankfully, the case was not entirely lost to time. The election of the Burmese president in 2016 capped off a shift in the country's politics from a military dictatorship to a citizen-led democracy. I've linked a Time article from that year describing the process and the relevant changes therein. Having lost so much in pursuit of pacifism, being metaphorically and physically in many cases broken, after decades staring down the barrel at virtually insurmountable odds, is it really still a total mystery why the Buddhists in Myanmar today are choosing violence as a means by which to deal with the steadfastly theocratic Muslims who oppose democracy and many facets of general human rights? To be absolutely clear, I do oppose the actions of the Buddhists this time around. I believe violence is always wrong, yet as I have already said, it's not necessarily the least wrong. At this point, they don't have a case. They only have a case for a violent, potentially dangerous ideological divide. So clearly, the murders are an incredible overreaction. Violence in the face of nothing, really. This does show us quite clearly, though, how deeply the wounds can cut into even the thickest of skin upon realizing the imperfections inherent in life on Earth. Of course, this entire story may seem like a damning indictment of 
government to you, since the rebels were quite clearly in the right from a western perspective. However, if it does look this way to you, then I urge you to think more deeply about the situation. What do you think would have happened if the Buddhists were at the helm of the Burmese government, yet they were equally pacifistic, and the authoritarians were the rebels, yet equally militant? The same thing. Those who are willing to use violence can at times be impervious to nonviolent opposition. This is the ultimate price of democracy and human rights, for we must all become hypocrites in violating the human rights of those who seek to violate the human rights of others. That said, we must be principled regarding how and why we implement that last resort, for it is clearly an injustice that can and ought to never be elevated beyond the status of a tragedy. Please see my ethical Nazi punching video if you're curious on when and where that is applicable. Here's a hint, never in response to speech. All right, if everybody's stuck all the way through this long video, then I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I was able to teach you something. And if anybody wants to see me go into any of those types of anarchy more in depth, I'd be happy to. Even, well, actually, especially the ridiculous ones. Those are really entertaining to me. But also the other ones as well, because I've dealt with them and I understand them, and I spend a lot of time debating them anyway. So I hardly mind doing it here so that, that others can see. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to see, I'd be glad to do some other videos as well. I'm starting to enjoy this, and I would quite like to be able to make more, so if you guys give me hints, I can at least know what you want me to put out there. Alright, that said, uh, everybody have a good day, and I'll catch you later.